I, I know, I know, Al Qaeda attacked us on 9-11, but we don't talk about that anymore. We're the allies of Al Qaeda. We support them in the in Syria, in Idlib, and we support them in Yemen now to take on the Houthi. And we have special operation forces that are there. It's not going to win a war. I mean, it, with all due respect to Delta Force and SEAL Team Six, you know they have very, very limited capabilities. They can go in, they can pop a high value target, they can go in and do certain cool stuff, but they can't fight a war. They're not a war fighting force. Um, they, they live in air conditioned facilities where they lift weights and they eat protein and they get big and they get strong and they run. And then they get into a helicopter and they fly and they run out and they pop, 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 kill some people, grab some people, come back to their air conditioned facility. That ain't war. War is living in a trench day after day after day. Um, you know, grinding it out. The Houthi know how to do war. They, Ansarallah, they've been doing war for a long time. They've been doing war not just against American trained and equipped Saudi ground forces, United Arab Emirates ground forces, the mercenaries that the United Arab Emirates bring in and beating all of these people. They've been taking on the air force of the Saudis. Um, you know, the F-15s and the advanced fighter aircraft with all the intelligence uh, that the United States provides, all the bombs that we give them. It's basically America with Saudi pilots. Um, and they've been beating them, beating them. Um, during the Gulf War, the, the thing that I was most heavily involved during the Gulf War in 1991 was counter scud operations, trying to find so-called mobile relocatable targets. Uh, that's a missile launcher with a missile on it. You know how many we killed? We threw, threw thousands of sorties. We brought Delta Force in. The British brought the Special Air Service in. We had all the sexy people out there doing their sexy stuff because we're America. We're great. We eat and we lift weights and we do go out there. We didn't kill any. None. Zero. Um, they're tough to get. Uh, you know, the Saudis aren't very good at striking them because they're, they're, they're tough to get. So, the Houthi are very good at, you know, launching drones, launching missiles with satellites looking for them, with, you know, intelligence assets looking for them, trying to target them and not getting them. And suddenly America comes in and I, I had to laugh the moment I saw it. Um, America struck, you know, a dozen Houthi missiles. They were out on their ramps getting ready to fire. I'm like, wow. So the Houthi forgot how to fight a war all of a sudden. Overnight, the Houthi forgot all the lessons that they had with the side and they just make a rookie error. Let's bring out our missiles and let's just line them up so that the satellite can see them. And then we will leave them there for a couple hours while the, the, the sortie is generated on the aircraft carrier and they launch and they come in and, you know, let them bomb us because we forgot how to fight. Or the Houthi went, here's a decoy and let's let the Americans drop all their bombs on the crap. Uh, that doesn't matter. Meanwhile, we're off doing our thing. The Houthi, they're, they're, they're very good at what they do. They've been fighting the Saudis since 2014 and winning. Um, we haven't brought any new skill set to this game. Um, and we've fallen for, you know, some big rookie mistakes. We're, we're blowing up, you know, decoys. We're, 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 you know, throwing away expensive military assets, you know, firing, you know, bombs that cost $100,000, missiles that cost millions against a decoy that cost $1,500. Um, this is this is just stupidity in the extreme. The, 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 the Houthi are, they control the pace of operations. Yeah, I don't know if most Americans know it, but we, we fought a, um, a major naval battle against the Houthi, I think, last week, and we lost. Now, we didn't lose any ships, but see, naval naval warfare isn't necessarily about sinking ships. It's about accomplishing things like protecting a strategic sea line of communication, guaranteeing passage of ships and things. And so we went in there and we built a screen, uh, air defense screen of destroyers that were supposed to prevent all missiles from coming in. And then two American flag container ships were going to run the gauntlet protected by this screen and they're running the gauntlet and the hoodies went, well, no, boom, 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 fire, fire, fire. Yeah. They got things shot down, but one penetrated landed hundred meters short of the, of the container ships. And they went and they turned around and fled. Now, if the goal of the mission that you're trying to accomplish was to get two container ships to run the gauntlet, uh, to get through, um, the, 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 the hoodie, you know, terrorized waters so that they could get to Israel, but they had to turn back. That means you failed. That means you lost. That means America planned a military operation, a naval operation, and the Houthi beat us. Um, 
This is the reality of what's going on right now. We're not in control of this situation. There's not a damn thing we can do to prevent this. We can't go to war against Yemen. We don't have the military resources to do this. You know, we can launch a couple, you know, commando attacks until we lose a helicopter. It goes down. Uh, then we try to bring in the Osprey with the, 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 the combat search and rescue team. It comes in. It goes down. Now we have, you know, 30 Americans trapped on the ground. So we bring in more resources. We get trapped there. I mean, this is what's going to happen. This is stupidity in the extreme. And the, and, the, and the question is why? All of this could be undone if we just picked up the phone and told Netanyahu, cease and desist. You're done in Gaza. You're done. Finished. We're not going to give you any more uh, weapons. We're not going to do anything. You fin you're finished. And as soon as that happens, it's done. It's finished. The hoodies stop. Shipping goes. The economies of the world are, are healed. But instead, we're just doubling down on stupid, tripling down on stupid. I mean, this is ridiculous what's going on. Yes, and speaking on tripling down, uh, as this is going on, uh, not only is the United States uh, not stopping what Israel is doing, but even as there is supposedly a temporary ceasefire agreement on the way, it hasn't been finalized just yet between Hamas and Israel, there has been intelligence that Hezbollah has said that they've received that Israel is actually preparing for a larger scale military operation, a war with Lebanon, which now if we follow our conversation, we talked about Al-Tanif base being struck and the U.S. possibly dragging themselves into a war with Iran. And we're talking about Yemen in the United States in the UK and of, of the Operation Prosperity, whatever the hell it is, um, uh, dragging themselves into a war with Yemen. And now we're talking about Israel. Uh, it, it, the suspicion is that they're preparing for a larger military operation against Lebanon, against Hezbollah. And even Israeli media had to admit that if that were to occur within 24 to 48 hours, there might be a thousand missiles uh, raining hellfire on Tel Aviv. So. I mean, uh, uh, talk about this uh, this contradiction here of uh, the ceasefire, supposedly the temporary ceasefire, supposedly going to affect soon, while at the same time Israel is uh, supposedly preparing for war with Lebanon. Well, let's just again let's get down to just basics here. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu and his war cabinet said early on that they were going to um, destroy Hamas politically, eliminate it as a political um, entity, and destroy it militarily, meaning that they will never again be able to repeat October 7th. What's happening today? Um, even the most, you know, Analysis that's most favorable to Israel says that 80% of the Hamas tunnel network still exists. It's there. Israel hasn't touched it. They got 20%. I think Israel got less than 20% because I think that Israel tends to exaggerate uh, what it's done. And, and they don't know what the Hamas tunnel network is. I mean, to sit there and say, well, we got 20%. That means you you know where they are. And if you knew where they are, then you'd get 100%. You don't know anything about the Hamas tunnel mm -hmm. network. So it's a guess, and I think 20% is just like giving Israel more credit than they actually deserve. Um, Hamas fought Israel to a standstill. It was never about Hamas's ability to control the territory above ground. Hamas was never designed to fight Israel toe-to-toe -to -toe above ground. It was about Hamas's ability to fight the war Hamas wanted to fight, which is to lure the Israelis in to ambushes that Hamas would control and have timing of, and Hamas had fought them to a standstill, and the Israelis have been beat. That's why they're withdrawing. That's why the Israelis are starting to pull their battalions out. Um, this is a huge political problem for Benjamin Netanyahu because he's failed. First of all, Hamas politically, um, if there was an election today in the, in, in, in the Palestinian territories, um, Hamas would win the election. Mahmoud Abbas would, and, and Fatah and the PLA, they would be swept away. 70, 80 percent of the Palestinians would vote for Hamas, not just in Gaza, but everywhere, because they're the only Palestinian entity that's standing up for the Palestinian state. 
of you know to to fighting for the Palestinian people, and the people now recognize it. Yes, the the Palestinians in Gaza have suffered tremendously. It's genocide. I mean, it's not me saying that. The International Court of Justice says, yeah, it looks like genocide to us. <laughs> looks like a duck talks like a squ- you know, quacks like a duck walks like a- it's a duck. It's genocide. Um, and the Palestinian people understand the price that they've had to pay uh, for this. <coughs> but it's a price they're willing to pay if at the end they get what they've been denied for over uh, 75 years, a state, a homeland, a place of their own, uh, without Israeli control, without Israeli domination. Um, and so, you know, the idea that the Palestinian people would turn their backs on Hamas because Hamas actually fighting for the future of Palestine is absurd. So politically, Israel's lost. Not only that, but around the world, the world is rallying around the cause of the Palestinian people, which is now the cause of Hamas. They don't have to say it. The, you, don't, you know, the people in the streets aren't saying we're pro-Hamas, but they're in the streets only because of Hamas. Remember, none of this would be happening if Hamas didn't launch the October 7th attack. They did. And they've triggered this series of events, which they predicted. This is what they wanted to happen because it's the only pathway to get to a Palestinian state. So Israel's lost politically and militarily. Hamas has won. Hamas beat them in a stand-up fight. I mean, Israel went into places, Khan Yunus, they went into other places. And they can't take it because Hamas said, you shall not pass. And the price the Israelis were paying was too high. And they had to pull out. So now Netanyahu could say, oh, gosh, we got beat again. Because remember, Netanyahu's the guy that gave them October 7th. And so he's already in a hole. And his only hope was to have this huge victory in Gaza where he wiped Hamas off the face of the earth. Didn't happen. Hamas has won. Hamas beat Israel. Let me say it again. Hamas beat Israel. So now Netanyahu's going, how do I remain relevant? Why don't we go kick the bigger hornet's nest? I mean, you know, there's a a movie, um, uh, Mark Wahlberg was in the movie. He's about a boxer. I can't remember the name of the movie. But uh, I remember one line where they're trying to set him up for a fighter. A, a fight and some dude they said yeah he's been he's been on the couch you know he's been on the couch you can take him even though this guy's bare and he got it the guy's huge and he's stacked and he beats the living snot out of Wahlberg. um well guess what's happening now <laughs> hamas is the guy that beat the crap out of Wahlberg. now the israel Wahlberg wants to take on mike tyson at his prime because that's hezbollah Hezbollah has been training for this fight since 2006. Hezbollah made a decision. You know, we we I think there's been a lot of talk about the you know mowing of the grass, the um, the 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 you know the the the, the, the there's the that suburb in um, in Beirut. Uh, da, you're getting me in a bad moment here, Danny, because I'm a little tired. Okay. But uh, it, it Dahia or something of that nature. But it's a it's a suburb that was bombed into oblivion by the Israelis is part of their collective punishment approach. Um, and, you know, the Israelis took that and, and said, that's how we're going to deter people. Well, you know what? The, the Hezbollah looked at that and said, Meh, if we're going to fight Israel again, we're not going to let them bring the fight to us. If there's going to be a big conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, Israel and Lebanon, um, that war is going to be fought on Israeli ser- territory. And so if Israel, Israel's sitting here saying, we're going to drive to the Latani River. I mean, they've tried that several times. Has never worked. Um, has, you know, Israel's lost three wars now uh, in recent history because Hamas just beat them. I mean, that's the reality. Nobody's running around saying that. I'm just telling you straight up right now, Hamas beat Israel in a stand-up fight. Boom. Defeat Israel, victory Hamas. But prior to that, you had Hezbollah beating Israel uh, when they evicted Israel from southern Lebanon. Um, and then you had Hez- Hezbollah beat Israel in 2006 in a stand-up fight. Um, so Hezbollah, who, who's, who's 2-0 and against Israel, undefeated, um, is sitting there saying, we're not going to let them bring the fight to us. We're going to bring the fight to them. So Hezbollah has all these tunnels that have been dug under the thing. And when the war comes, they're going to pop up. They have brigades specially trained for this task. They will take over northern Israel to the Galilee Sea. They will cut off the Golan Heights. Um, That's the plan. And there's nothing Israel can do to stop it. So the Israelis are sitting here planning for one fight. Another fight's going to happen that they're not prepared to handle. And just imagine if you're a reserve Israeli battalion. 
who just got the snot handed to him, kicked out of him in Gaza. And now you've been pulled out and you get a couple days leave. You get to go drink your gold star beer and hang around with your women. And, all that. and now you go back to the front and you're a little fatter and out of shape still. And, um, and now you're going to go in and teach those damn is, you know, Lebanese a lesson, those Hezbollah guys a lesson. And you're going across the border and you're making some progress. You get a hundred yards here, a hundred yards there. And all of a sudden, there's 10,000 Hezbollah fighters behind you, and uh, you're trapped. What's going to happen? You're going to die. You're going to die. This is going to get ugly really fast. And, it, you know, Hezbollah's missiles are far more capable, far more accurate. They can defeat any Israeli air defense system out there. And so, again, Israeli airplanes have to take off from a base. That base won't exist anymore. Israeli command and control operates from facilities that have been historically untouchable by by its enemies. Not, they'll be blown up. There won't be any command and control. There won't be any communication connectivity. And these fat little Israeli reservists are going to be, you know, skewered and, and, and barbecued by Hezbollah. It's going to get ugly really fast. This is the reality. Hezbollah is going to wipe Israel off the map. If that's what Israel wants, that's the fight that's going to happen. They're going to lose Northern Israel. And when they lose Northern Israel, they're never getting it back. I mean, that's the other thing they need to understand. You know, um, so why is Israel doing this? And and believe me, Danny, if I know this, the Israeli military knows this. Hell, you're reading about this in the Israeli military. They, I mean, newspapers, they know it. Haaretz knows what's going to happen. Everybody knows what's going to happen. So why are they allowing it to happen? Because Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't care about Israel. He only cares about Bibi Netanyahu. He only cares about his little cabal of extreme right-wing, um, you know, Zionists who just the other day, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe it. There was this, they had a gathering where they were um, talking about the development of Gaza in a, in a, in a post-conflict scenario where they're going to build homes and develop, and they're all holding arms, dancing and all this stuff. And I'm like, Hey guys, you just got beat. You lost Gaza. It ain't yours. You're done. And I hope that they're dancing when Hezbollah shows up. I'd like to see Hezbollah surround that facility. I'd like to see Hezbollah capture these people. I'd like to see Hezbollah bring these people to justice because nobody else will. The International Criminal Court won't. Um, Israel has been found to be engaged in genocide um, or at least practices that a reasonable person could call genocide. And the world's ignoring it. Um, Hezbollah will bring justice to Israel. And, uh, you know, they, they, Israel only brought it upon themselves. I mean, I don't wish harm on any, I can't say that. I do wish harm on these Zionists, especially these far right wing uh, lunatics. But, you know, I don't want innocent people to suffer. But, and there will be innocent people who will suffer. I mean, we've already seen 2 million Palestinians suffer in Gaza. Um, Millions of Israelis are going to suffer now, but they only have one person to blame. That's Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah, and there seems to be a, a good amount of politics uh, involved here, both on the U.S. and the Israeli side. All of these multiple fronts of war in the Middle East, whether we're talking about Gaza or we're talking about Yemen or we're talking about uh, uh, what happened at Al Tanif in Syria and and what that means for war uh, against Iran. How much of this then is, is you said, you, you know, you're, I think you're, you're saying is that uh, Bibi Netanyahu is in a kind of a, a war for self-preservation. How much of this also is Biden's attempt to harness some kind of political capital out of war, which for me seems to be outrageous and just kind of out of, uh, out of left field almost, given that, all of what we have just talked about points to a complete and utter lack of success, which is kind of required if you're going to use war as political capital, or at least um, uh, should be required if uh, we're talking about rational uh, thinkers. But well, what's your take? Look, if there's a master plan by the Biden administration, let's, let's back up just a second here. The Biden administration was taken by surprise on October 7th, just like Israel was. Prior to October 7th, the Biden administration, when they came in, you know, they, they gave lip service to, um, you know, 
a two state solution. They came in and said, we believe in a two state solution. We, we want, they, they, they told Benjamin Netanyahu, you shame on you. You can't do those settlements, but they didn't do anything to stop it. What they did do is to buy into the master plan of the Abrams accord. That is the 2020 agreement, uh, brokered by the Trump administration that would seek to normalize Israel in the Arab world. Uh, that basically you bypass the whole Palestinian problem. You go straight into Israel, um, you know, becoming a good neighbor to Saudi Arabia, to Bahrain, to the United Arab Emirates, and, and everybody's working together, and peace and prosperity is going to break out because the economy is going to be so good. I, you know, we had that moment last fall where – Joe Biden was in, I think, uh, India for the G20 summit, and he held this press conference, and he talked about the, let me get this right, the Middle East Economic Corridor, is the India Middle East Economic Corridor. But the idea is that, you know, India would be able to put containers on a ship and then ship it to uh, Dubai or Abu Dhabi, where they'd be offloaded, and they'd get on a train in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, and there'd be rail connectivity between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and they would go on through Jordan. Wow, this is really cool. And then into Israel. Imagine that, a train that connected the United Arab Emirates through Saudi Arabia and Jordan into Israel to a port called Haifa. And then they would take those containers, put them on a ship, and they would go to Greece, and you'd have this wonderful connectivity and everybody's going to be rich, rich. The economy's working, baby. And Benjamin Netanyahu, when he got up to the United Nations General Assembly, instead of showing the cartoon bomb about how close Iran is to the nuclear weapon, instead he talked about the same thing. This is the new face of the world. Israel is one of the world. We are one of you. We are just like you. We are peaceful. We are economic. That's everything that was supposed to happen. That was the Biden thinking. There was no strategy for a war against Iran or to deter Hezbollah. We weren't thinking that. We were off playing this other game. Meanwhile, Hamas went eh, get wrong October 7th and the whole world. And we've been reacting ever since. So we don't have a strategy. Danny, to, to, to deter someone, let me, let me just educate people real quick. Um, military operations on a large scale are complicated things. And they, you know, wars aren't won, you know, on the battlefield. I mean, I know we talk about boots on the ground, airplanes dropping bombs, mm -hmm. all that. But none of that happens without logistics. Logistics is the key. And the thing about logistics is it takes a long time to prepare for power projection halfway around the world. You know, if we're going to do something, to, again, um, the first Gulf War, Desert Storm. There's something called the tip fiddle. Now, that's a fancy term. It may have changed because I've been out of the military for a while. But it is basically the – it's a phased introduction of logistics equipment. So as we're – if we're going to take 700,000 American troops from the United States or from Germany and we're going to move them to the Middle East to fight a war, um, we have to flow that equipment in there. We have to marry up the troops with the equipment at the ports or at the airfields, and you have to phase it in so that you don't have all the troops land at once, but no equipment's there, or all the equipment jammed into the ports and everything can't handle. It has to be phased in properly. It has to be planned. This takes a lot of planning. All the ammunition has to be considered. What, what you're doing, ammunition, fuel, any, everything, bandages, bullets, food, all this has to be thought out in advance. We started planning the Gulf War in October. We began flowing equipment in there for the fight that ended up happening in January. Um, massive uh, mil military operational planning. None of that existed, Danny, prior to October 7th. Everything we're doing right now, we're making it up. We don't have the planning, the means. We don't have any notion of large-scale combat in the Middle East anymore. We forgot how to do that. Hell, we were getting out of there. Remember, we got out of the Middle East so we could go to Europe, and then we're supposed to stabilize Europe so we go to the Pacific. 
Then Ukraine came and we went, what the hell? So now we can't go to the Pacific. We're stuck in Europe. And then the Middle East blows up again. We go, damn, well, we can't go in the Middle East because we're all in Europe anymore. We don't have enough troops to do anything. We can't supply it. We don't have, we will run out of ammunition. We will run out of cruise missiles. We will run out of surface to air missiles. We will run out of everything. Bombs. Do you think we just have an infinite supply of bombs? We just gave all our damn bombs to Israel. And Israel dropped all those damn bombs on Gaza and lost. And now we want to have a fight, <laughs> not only with the Houthi, but now we want to expand it to Iran. Remember, Iran's huge. That means lots of targets, lots of targets that need lots of bombs to drop on them. Lots of bombs that have to be dropped by airplanes that consume a lot of fuel. Where's the fuel coming from, Danny? They haven't planned it out. They haven't planned it out. They need ships full of aviation fuel flowing to the region that don't exist anymore. We haven't thought any of this out. This is, this is the reality of what's happening right now. We're making it up as we go along. We somehow think that we're going to deter Iran through a three- to five-day bombing campaign. No. We need a three- to five-year bombing campaign if we're going to deter Iran, and we just don't have the resources to do it. We don't have any artillery ammunition because we gave it all to Ukraine, but we lied because apparently we had a lot of artillery ammunition that we could turn around and give to the Israelis. And the Ukrainians are going, wait a minute. You told us you didn't have anything, and now you just gave it all the Israelis. But now we really don't have anything because it's all done. It's finished. We, we are literally, the, the emperor has no clothes, Danny. The emperor has no clothes.